It's okay. Okay, welcome back from Chavrutot. Um, I wanna just before I start the Shi'or now, I wanna just say that the Shi'or is in loving memory dedicated in loving memory of Tauba Schiff Reinhold from Brzezko, I hope I'm pronouncing that right, from Brzezko, Antwerp and Jerusalem, who taught her daughters to rebel. Okay, we are now gonna get started with our sources. I'm gonna pull up the sources and we're gonna go through them. Okay, here goes our, our um, so what we started with is Hillel Hitkim Prusbo Mipnei Tikkun HaOlam. So very simply, we have a Tikkun HaOlam. We talked about this last time where we have an issue and we need to resolve it. So Hillel institutes Prusbo in order to make a better situation. To which the Gemara now starts off and says, oh, sorry, I'm trying to roll it up a little bit. Okay, that's not working. Um, no. Okay, leave it like this. Tanan Hatam. Okay, what I did here is I, I actually put in the grammar so you could see in the quotation marks, so you could check your work. Tanan Hatam. Prusbal enoma shamit. Okay, so the Mishnah there says, so the first thing you have to know is when it says Tanan Hatam, okay, I'm going to now show you on the page of the Gemara. Actually, let me stop my share for a minute and open up the page of the Gemara big. Quick moment. Okay. So if you look at the Gemara, Tanan Hatam, this little chet over here, this is important stuff to understand, this little chet next to the words Tanan Hatam, I don't know if you read it in the Gemara, but if you look at there, it goes up to here at the top, we have a Mesoret Hashas. Mesoret Hashas tells you where the original source is. So that chet goes to here and it says, Shvi'it Perik Yud Mishnah Gimel, okay? So that tells you that this Mishnah, Tanan HaTam means it says in the Mishnah there, okay, Tanan is always a Mishnah, Tanya is a Braita, and there is going to be in some other Masechet. So it happens to be in Shvi, which makes sense. Okay, this is a good example, by the way, of um, where we want to learn something and we're learning it. Masechet Shvi doesn't have a Bavli on it, okay? Masechet Shvi was something that only had it was in Zra'im, and there's only Yerushalmi on it, no Bavli. So because of that, the Mishnah here, when we get something in the Gemara, where because of this Tikkun Olam, we talked about this last week, that we have a, a slew of cases that are all bunched together because they're all an issue of Tikkun Olam. So because of that, they now want to say, oh, well, this gives us an opportunity to get into something that there's no Bavli on because the Bavli was written in Babylonia and there was no issue of Zra'im. Oh, Zra'im is all the mitzvot hatzliot ba'aret, things that are dependent on the land of Israel. So because of that, it's an opportunity for the Gemara here to say, oh, let's delve into it. Because of that, the Gemara goes in depth and tells us more about it. Okay, so now we're going to go back and open up our sources. Um, just playing with the share screen so I can show the other one. Um, okay. So now we go back to the Gemara here. And I don't know why I just opened it like that. No, sorry. Okay, let's start again. <laughs> um, here, I accidentally clicked. Okay, so now we're going to now quote the Mishnayot from there. This is one of the things that Hillel instituted. What prompted him to do this? He saw that people stopped loaning money. And he points out here very importantly, even though we have this idea of Shemitah, which comes from the Torah, right? what happens? People are now, this created another Torah issue, which is the Torah says, if you want to know where this is, you can look at the Gabara at the Torah or tells you exactly where the Pasuk is from. It's from Sefer Dvarim, chapter 16, uh, 15. Okay, which really, you have to read the whole verse to understand, but it says, maybe you should, you'll say, the Shemitah year is coming, and you'll look poorly upon your poor neighbors, right? And then God says, you'll have a sin because you didn't lend people money. So what happened? People weren't lending money. Big problem. Ahmad beats Kim Prusbal. Vizel Gufoshal Prusbal. And this is what the Prusbal is, the Mishnah tells us. Mosrani Lachem Ploni Dayanim Shabemakam Ploni. I'm coming before you, judges, 
so-and-so judges in so-and-so place, any loan I have, you basically come to the court and you say to the court, now court doesn't necessarily mean court. Court means any three people, right? If you know when you go to, you do hatarat nedarim, you do it in front of three people, any three people. So you go and you say, any loan I have, I'm going to collect whenever I want. The dayanim chotmim lemata o'edim, you need judges to sign or witnesses, and you're done. And good, now you can just collect your money. It's a little bit strange how this works. So the first thing to note is that if you look at the Mishnayot there, okay, so the Mishnah is there, list. Ha'ones v'hamefate, okay? So now I wanted to go back into the context of the Mishnayot in Masechet Shvi. And look at the context. Ha'ones v'hamefate v'hamotzi shemra, v'chol ma'asebetin. These are people who are obligated to pay someone else for damage they did, okay? This is whether you rape, seduced a woman, okay, not for us, but a man rapes or seduces a woman, and or a man claims that his wife wasn't a virgin when he marries her. If they lied about these things, though, or the Mosi Shema was a lie, the Onus of Mufata obviously wasn't a lie, they have to pay a certain fine. Now, this fine is called the Maase Beiti. This, they're telling you, a Mishamti, okay? There's no law of, you know, Shemitah comes and you no longer have to pay. Okay, that's category one that's on the outs. Another category, Mavel Amashkon. If you give collateral for your loan, you give a security and you say, okay, in the event that I don't pay you back, take it from here. Well, then also Shemitah doesn't override it because you've basically given back the money, so to speak. So your loan is not canceled. Third case, Hamoster Sharatav Lebeti. If I give all my documents to the court and I say, listen, Instead of me claiming the loan, I want you to claim the loan, okay? The court is in charge, and a We, If you got to the Midrash Halakha, you saw the source for that halacha. Then the Mishnah says, then we go to the Mishnayot that we saw already, which is Prisbal Leno Meshamet, okay? And Prisbal is another one in the list. So we have number one, Masebet. Number two, loaning on their, with a security. Number three, giving your documents to the court. And number four, Prisbal. That's the way the Mishnah lines them up. According to the Mishnah, there is no connection between Moser Sharatav Lebetin and Prisbal. And in fact, in the language of the Mishnah, it doesn't really sound connected either. It's a little bit connected because you go to the court. But notice what he says. He doesn't say Moser Ani Lachem, my documents. He says, I'm making a declaration to you that any, uh, any chov that I have, right? Anyone that owes me money, I will collect whenever I want. And the, and the court signs, and it sounds from here, these are two disconnected things, okay? But if you move to the Midrash Tanaim, which is a Midrash Halacha, there's two major differences here. One, and this will be good review from the course that, uh, that you, if you took Leah Sarna's introductory course, which is number one, the main difference between a Midrash Halacha and a Mishnah, you can see it very well highlighted here, which is that the Midrash Halacha starts with a Pasuk. The Mishnah didn't get to any psukim at all. It didn't derive anything from a pasuk. The Midrash, it did quote a pasuk about why Hillel instituted Prisbal, but it didn't connect how he got to it from a pasuk. The Midrash Tanaim here, which is a Midrash Halacha, comes and says, we're going to derive this from a verse. What's the verse? Asher yelacha to yadecha. That's the verse that discusses the, the, the shmitat ksafim, what we call the cancellation of, of loans. It says, whatever you have in your, that your brother has that's supposed to get back to you, tishamek, right? You no longer collect. Now, notice it says, et achicha. Achicha always means your brother, which means what? Lo hamoser shtarotav lebeitin. It means between me and you, but not between the court and me or the court and you. Once the court comes in, then it's out. Okay, so we knew that from the Mishnah, except that we didn't know where the Mishnah got it from, but now we know where the Mishnah got it from. It comes from this verse because it says achicha. However, the Midrash Tanaim now does something very different than what the Mishnah did. Instead of listing it as a separate, the Mishnah, the Midrash Halacha says from here we get, by the way, Midrash Halacha, just so I be clear, it's from the time of the Tanaim, okay? It's just a different genre of a book that was written then. And and so number one, it's it's a different style. But number two, sometimes the content is different from there in the Mishnah. And here the content is very different. Mikan itkin Hillel Prisbal. This is where Hillel got the idea for Prisbal from. That's, the Mishnah really doesn't explain anything. The Mishnah says, 
you can just give this document and, you know, it's done. And that Hillel kind of, it sounds like Hillel made something up and decided that because of tikkun olam, we're going to change what normally happens. And, you know, he made what we call yesh me'ayim, right? It came from nowhere. According to the Midrash, it didn't come from nowhere at all. What did he say? He basically says the prisball is basically giving your documents to the court. And it's, so then the question is, well, if that's the case, well, then isn't that Torah law? Like, why is it tikkun olam, right? It's a little bit strange here because what Hillel basically does is he basically says, we're going to all give our documents to the court. And with that, we're going to override this entire law of Shemitah, Shemitah Ksafim. Because as long as you give it to the court, Torah says, you can collect your loan. So to understand this, so here's the chart, okay? According to the Mishnah, what's the relationship between Moser Shtar Tav Lebet and giving your contracts to the court or Prusba? There's actually no relationship between them at all, other than the fact that they're both exceptions to the rule of Shmitat Ksafim, of loans being canceled. But according to the Midrash Chana'im, it's basically the same thing. And what Hill really did was, and now there's going to be, I'm going to give you one approach, and then we're going to read the Ritva, who gives a little bit of a different approach of understanding the Midrash Chana'im. And then I'll send you back to Chavruta again, which is basically Hill said he popularized it. He basically said, I want, maybe not everybody knew this law. And what he said is, listen, if you all give your contracts to the court, well, the Torah says, then you can collect your money. So everybody, let's do it. And he basically takes something that was very uncommon, likely, and makes it very common. And that was his takana. Now, at that point, it's not such a big takana at all, right? It's He's basically taking the Torah law and he's saying, well, let's popularize it. The Ritva has a very interesting commentary here. So the Ritva says, in Tomal, if you want to say, well, then it's basically to Oraita, right? He, it should be, I don't know why there's a quote there. It should be there, but okay. But if you're going to say what Hillel did was basically from the Torah, and as we see in the Sifre, which is another Midrash Halakha, which says something very similar. Okay, I'm going to just basically skip that part because it's already like the Midrash Halakha. And here come the key words. To have ya. It's not exactly like you're giving, and if you notice the wording of it, you're not actually giving your documents to the court. It's as if you're giving your documents to the court. As you say, says, ah, it's like you're giving your documents because what do you really do? You write out this document that says, as you saw before, right? It says, I'm giving our doc, right, uh, um, I'm giving a, a declaration before you, and I'm now going to collect my loans. You don't actually physically give your documents to the court. So what Hillel said, so again, we have one option is it has nothing to do with Prisbol and, and Moster Shtaratav are two totally different things. We had the other explanation that they're actually one and the same. And all Hillel did is popularize it. According to the Ritva, the way he understands the Midrash Halakha is a little bit different. What he says is, no, what he did was he said that even if you don't give your documents, you can write this document of Prisba, and it's as if you gave your documents. So he comes up with this in between because he really says it can't be the Hillel was just coming and reinstituting this Torah law because then that wouldn't be called tikkun olam. It wouldn't be this, right? Tikkun olam is usually where we change something. So what he did is basically he said, even if you don't give your documents, it's as if you give the documents. The chen amar Yerushalmi, and he says, you can even see in the Yerushalmi, it says, da'afilu nitinuim b'romi, even if your documents are in Rome, this will still be effective. So he comes up with this middle position. The Ritva goes on to ask, to prove what he's saying. He says, and you can prove this from the Mishnah. It's clear that Prisbal is rabbinic because it says there, and then it said, Prisbal in Omashamet. So it lists it separately. And so he says, if the Mishnah had put them all together as one, then we could say that Hillel's big thing he did was popularize the Torah law. But then he would have put them together in one Mishnah because they're really one and the same. 
So therefore, he says, since he didn't put them together in one Mishnah, it seems clear that that's not the same. And then they ask, he asks another question. The Ritva has very excellent questions here, which is why I wanted to read through it. He says, if you say, Amai lo tiku misirat why did he have to come up then with this prusbal darabana? Why didn't he just popularize it and tell everybody, listen, if you really want to make sure you can collect your loan, so give your documents to the court. And later in one minute, we're going to see even as a better suggestion. So, because really, again, start from our base. Our premise is there's this concept of shmitaxafim, that all your loans get canceled. However, there's a number of exceptions to the rule. One is misirat shtarot lebeitin. So if you have that option, why doesn't everyone just go to the court and give their documents? So he says there's three problems. One is maybe there's people who won't do it. And then, you know, if there's people who don't do it, he wanted to make it easier for them. Number two, maybe you're in one place and your documents are somewhere else and you can't access them. No, right, they didn't have scanners and things that made things much easier than, than nowadays. Number three, the according to the Ramban, he says, Prusbal doesn't know it only work for a loan that you took with a, with, a, with a document, in which case you could give your document to the court. The Ramban says you can even do Prusbal if you just had an oral agreement. Well, if you had an oral agreement, there's no document to actually physically hand over to the court. So therefore comes the Ritva and he says, that's why Hillel did this in between. He said, I'm going to use this Torah law of Moser Shtaratav. I'm going to create something that's modeled after it. It's similar to it. It's not the same. My chiddush is, what Hillel says is, my chiddush is, according to the Ritva, is that I'm going to say that we can do this. It's like the Torah law of Moser Shtaratav, the Beit. And the very last question of the Ramban is, why didn't he just say, this is another way you could have avoided it, that when you take out the loan originally, this is another way. Remember I told you if the loan isn't due yet, then it's okay. So likewise, if I made a condition and when we, I gave you the loan, I said, we made a condition, we stipulated that this is under condition. I'm loaning you the money that when the Shemitah year comes, I'm not going to cancel the loan. It would work. But again, he says, listen, we have to look around. People won't necessarily remember to do that when they take the loan. In other words, Hillel came and said, right, we have to, again, this is the Ritva's understanding, but what he says is we have to make sure that we cover all our bases. What about the people who don't have their documents around? What about the people who didn't remember to make the condition in the beginning? What about, right, there's so many different factors that will, Again, what will happen, because there's so many different factors, it will prevent people from loaning money in the first place. So came Hillel and he says, we have to institute some new thing and we have to fix the problem. And the way we're going to do it is not to make everybody give their documents to the court because that's too difficult. We're going to make, we're going to model after that, but change it a little bit. Make it as if you did it. So this is as if you gave it to the court and but even though you didn't. The big question that's really left, and that's what the second half of the class, and that's where we're going to get much more into the Gemaras here, which is, how could he do that? <laughs> the, the law, by Torah law, is you have to give your documents to the court. So how could Hillel come and say, again, whether you read it the way the Midrash reads it, the Midrash Tanaim, and the way the Ritva understands it, or whether you understand it, if you say he popularized it, well, then it's not so difficult. But if you say, like, the Mishnah seemed to say, which is, this is a whole new thing, yesh me'ayim, where it comes out of nowhere, then the question is even stronger. And that's the first question the Gemara is going to ask, which is, if by Torah law, the loans get canceled, how can Hillel come and just change this? And it's a fabulous question because it really gets to the, to the core of Takanot Rabbanan. How much power do the rabbis have? And depending on how you read this and how you answer the question and how the sugi is going to play out, it's all affected by how much power you actually think the rabbis have, right? The more you say that Hillel, like even just what we did now, if you say Hillel just popularized something that was Torah law, then you obviously don't think that the rabbis have a lot of power to change things. So when you see he made this big takanat, you're going to say, well, it was really only th this, right? He really just popularized something that was already existent by Torah law. If you say he made up something yesh me'ayin out of nowhere, then you basically are saying, 
that the rabbis have the power to come and create new things without issue at all. So that's a very, you know, or you have the middle position. So it's a very fascinating concept. And I'm going to throw you into the Chavrutot again. Um, we'll have about, I guess we could take uh, 18 minutes, I'll give you, and cut a little off my shear, cut a little off your Chavrutah. Um, and I just want to point out there's one mistake in the sheet that I noticed, which is on question number, here, I'll pull it up for a second just to show you, on question number here. Okay, on question three, you're supposed to punctuate a section. Okay, I actually added it in. I basically copied and pasted the words here because the words were supposed to be in the box to punctuate, but they're not in the box. Your box is empty. So you can just take the words, copy and paste them into the box and then punctuate them. It's actually pretty short anyway. So if you don't do that, it's also fine. You can just punctuate it in your head. It's a very short section. Okay, to have retouched.